Welcome to the Growth Now Movement. I'm your host, Justin Shank. I'm an entrepreneur, speaker, and podcaster who years ago decided to go on a journey on how to grow in all areas of my life. What I found out was it's really a matter of focusing on the four pillars of life, business, relationships, spirituality, and wellness. And that's what we do here. We explore how to continuously grow in those areas, all while having a ton of fun doing it. I'm really excited you're on this journey with me. Now let's get to this week's episode. This week, I sit down with Jeff Brown. Jeff is an award-winning radio producer and personality and former nationally syndicated morning show host. And you'll hear it in his voice. It's it's a phenomenal radio voice. And following a 26-year career in radio, Jeff went boss-free in 2013 and soon after launched the Read to Lead podcast. It's gone on to become a four-time Best Business Podcast nominee and has featured Jeff's interviews with today's best business and nonfiction authors, including actor and author Alan Alda, Stephen M. R. Covey, Seth Godin, John Maxwell, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Just an amazing list of guests, including Gary Vaynerchuk and Simon Sinek as well. Jeff has personally coached hundreds of successful podcasters around the globe, many of them award nominees and winners themselves, and has consulted on podcasts for the U.S. government, two of the largest churches in the U.S., and numerous multi-million dollar companies. In this episode, we dive into the power of reading. We talk about how Jeff taught himself to love to read because he used to hate it. We talk about tips and tricks on creating reading habits for yourself so you can constantly be learning. Uh, And we talk about some of the benefits to consistently reading new books, et cetera, et cetera. See, the crazy thing is Jeff reads about a book a week, which is absolutely mind blowing. So he pulls from knowledge from some of the world's greatest leaders, whether it is for public speaking, business growth, self-development, uh, or anything that he just enjoys reading. And, and I think you guys are going to love his approach to reading uh, and why he believes reading is the gateway to leading. Uh, and I, I think you guys are going to love this conversation. So before we get to it, I want to remind you guys that Growth Now Summit Live is coming and it's coming quick. So make sure you grab your tickets, growthnowsummit.com. The speaker lineup is really shaping up. I think you guys are going to love who I'm announcing here in the next couple of weeks and months, but make sure you grab your tickets now. We have less than 70 tickets left. So go ahead at growthnowsummit.com, grab your tickets today, and I cannot wait to see you there in May of 2022. Now, without further ado, let's get to the episode with Jeff Brown. Jeff, welcome to the podcast, man. Well, Justin, I'm excited to be here. Thank you for for inviting me to do this. No, you know, it's funny. We had we bumped into each other a number of times at different events, and I constantly go, Jeff, you got to come on the show, and it just hasn't happened. And, and actually, what triggered me to reach out to you on Facebook is you were just on my friend Terry Weaver's show, and he texted me. He goes, I was blown away by the conversation. You have to have Jeff on the oh. podcast. And I was like, dude, I've been meaning to. Perfect opportunity. <laughs> um, and we're going to get into a ton of great content about how important reading is and, and how do you pick the books and how do you stay you know uh, attached to the habit of... I'm guilty of getting into rhythms of I'm going to read a little bit and I'll get into it for a while and then it just falls off and, and, I, and I lose the habit of reading. Um, so I'm really intrigued by your approach to that. But before we get into all that stuff, tell me a little bit about Jeff Brown. Who is Jeff today? And then we'll break down how you got there. Mm. Yeah, Jeff today is a guy who uh, loves to talk. <laughs> Thank you for this opportunity. Now, I, you know, I spent a, a career in radio, so I, I'm kind of an old hat at that. But uh, by that, I mean uh, public speaking workshops. Uh, I'm uh, doing more and more of that now as the book is coming out. And so uh, I love to teach. That's kind of where that stems from. Uh, I love to share what I've learned. And so any opportunity to get in front of an audience, Justin, and, and do that, uh, I will <laughs> take take up that opportunity. Uh, like this one. Uh, so uh, that's uh, where much of my uh, time is spent in addition to uh, hosting my own podcast, Read to Lead, for the last uh, just just a little over eight years now. Uh, so I continue to do that, publish a weekly episode where I interview an author of a, of a business, personal growth, leadership type book. And it's sort of an audio cliff notes uh, for those who um, want to read, but for whatever reason, haven't been able to uh, make it happen. My book or my uh, podcast rather can sort of be a, maybe an on-ramp to getting to that eventually. In the meantime, you can sort of get a Cliff's Notes version of, of different books and get it straight from, from the author. So that's how, excuse me, how I've been spending much of my time as of late. And I'm expecting um, 
uh, and counting on those speaking opportunities to increase as, as the book uh, gets further and further out into the uh, marketplace. <laughs> yeah, no, I hear that. And, and hopefully the world doesn't shut back down, right? Like, <laughs> right. So, which, which is uh, a whole nother conversation. I have an event that was supposed to happen in 2020 that is now happening in May of 2022. Um, oh and so the constant delay of that has been uh, rather insane. But, but yeah, man, same. Wow. Like, you know, to be able to get on stages and talk and all that stuff. By the way, if you guys are hearing Jeff's voice, you can tell his his voice was made for radio or podcasting, <laughs> which totally makes sense. And eight years, I didn't expect to go down this this uh, this path, but eight years of podcasting, that's a long time. Like people look at me and go five and a half years and they go, wow, that's, that's a journey. Um, mm -hmm. But we came from the day of like, people would be like, what's a podcast? <laughs> what was your, was it from the radio to like, this is the next natural step? What made you hop into podcasting so early? Yeah. And it's funny you say so early. And when I jumped in, I felt like, you know, I was kind of late at the time. <laughs> it's funny how we, how we view our situation relative to everything else going on that, that we, that we see. Um, so it felt late to me, but yeah, it was right before, uh, serial, the serial podcast mm -hmm. made big waves and brought a bunch of new people to, to podcasting. It was before, you know, John Dumas had <laughs> you know, podcasters paradise and, created the John Dumas effect, if you want to call it that, uh, brought a lot of people to the space. Um, but I I was looking at a career after radio uh, and beginning to uh, contemplate what that would look like. And before I knew the answer to that question, uh, I thought, well, I, I, I've been following podcasts. I enjoy podcasts. I love podcasts. They've helped me tremendously. Uh, I think I would like to start a podcast, but what would I do a podcast about? And so I sat on that idea for a while, but one day it just hit me going home, counting up kind of my goals and, and the number of books I had read so far that year. This was like in March. And when I realized I had read about a book a week, that was a surprise wow. to me because I didn't realize I was reading at that pace. And, and, and I'm somebody who used to dislike reading like a lot. And so I, I had originally had you know goals that I would put in place of like a book a month. And before I knew it, I was reading much many more books than that. And so when I realized that I was reading a book a week, a light bulb went off in my head. And I thought, maybe there, maybe that's that podcast idea that I've been trying to pin down. I'm reading a book a week anyway. I kind of thought of podcasts as being, you know, weekly things. Not all of them are, obviously, but most of the ones I listened to were. Um, and, and it was then that I started kind of planning and, and researching. I, I looked at the idea, looked at what else was out there. You know, could I carve out some space for myself? I uh, began looking at what went into to, you know, publishing one, what equipment I would need. I was in radio, but I didn't, you know, I didn't have like, you know, equipment at home. Everything was at yeah. the radio station. I went there to do my job. I didn't have equipment here. So I had to look at that. And then I began um, inviting people to, 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 to interview with, uh, inviting people on the show. And scheduling those. And so it was very methodical, March, April, May, June. And then in July of that year, 2013, I launched with, which happened to, I didn't know this at the time, but I would be let go from my radio job in June of that year, wow. a month before I was going to launch the podcast. So I launched the podcast anyway. Uh, I just thought to myself, well, now it just got a whole lot easier to schedule interviews <laughs> and I'll hear that. I'll figure out what I'm going to do next. So that's, that's kind of how it all started. No, I, I love that. By the way, I, when I started my podcast, it, I had a day job uh, as well. Mm. And when I was doing these interviews, like I, I did an interview with somebody in Israel, whereas if I didn't have a day job, I could just have done it in the middle of the day. We ended up doing it like one 30 in the morning um, to make it work. Cause I couldn't make it work otherwise. Like I just did crazy stuff to, <laughs> to get it in. Now it's so much easier being able to create my own schedule and all that stuff. Now you had mentioned something really, really interesting. You said I was reading a book a week, by the way, that's, cr that's blistering speeds, uh, <laughs> as far as reading, reading books. But you also said that you, it's something you used to despise. It's something that you didn't enjoy at all. What was the switch for you going from hating to read and, and where did that come from? And then what happened in your life that you're like, you know what, I, I really enjoy this process. Yeah. Great question. Let me start by saying, before I say anything else, I love teachers. I just didn't love school. Yeah. <laughs> Some of the teachers I've had a bit, had, had the biggest influence in my life ever. My sister's a teacher and a darn good one, but I didn't like school. School educated out of me the desire to read. And if I'm being completely frank, the desire to learn. 
Mm. So when I left school, my attitude was, well, thank good. That's thank goodness that's over. Thank goodness there's no more learning that has to be done now. Hearing me say that out loud, you, you know, we can laugh because that sounds really dumb. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I was, I was 21, 22 years old out of college, and I was really dumb. Um, I had books sat down presented to me like from Zig Ziglar and Og Mandino that I just ignored that I that I didn't take to because I wasn't uh, maturity wise I don't think I was I was ready I was just done with all that um, didn't want to do it anymore fast forward about 10 years I'm in my early 30s and as embarrassing as this is to admit I was not aware that there were books out there written by people infinitely smarter than me on topics that were of interest to me that through reading those books in exchange for 20 bucks, I could learn about those things to the whatever extent I wanted to. And it not involved having to go back to school. I could actually read things I was interested in reading, not what school told me I had to read. Uh, and that was presented to me through a book club at the uh, radio station I was working at at the time. And the first book I remember being presented to me was Seth Godin's uh, Purple Cow. And this time I took to that. This time I was like, oh, this is this is exactly what I'm looking for. I'm on the air, but I want to know more about behind the scenes and marketing. And, you know, Seth and that book is all about, you know, how to be remarkable. And there's not like a five point checklist of now go do these things. Once you read a book like that, it's very big picture, picture and vision driven, but I just loved it. Uh, and then I read John Maxwell and I read Pat Lincioni. And I read Liz Weissman and on and on and on. I couldn't get enough. Uh, it just changed everything uh, for me. So when I dedicated this book, I've just written, I dedicated it uh, in tandem to Matt Austin, the uh, leader at the time who uh, instituted that book club and Seth Godin, those two guys together helped reignite uh, my love for reading. And that was about 18 years ago now. Uh, and that led to this podcast and which of course led, led to the book. No, I, you know, I love that. And, <clears throat> you know, it's interesting. I'm very similar at, at, with the mindset of now school's done. I never have to, to learn again. The, I, I don't know how good of a student you were. I imagine you were a good student. I was not at a 1.7 GPA at one point in high school. Cause I just checked out. I was like, this is not for me. This is the yeah. worst. And so I really, I'm very similar. I associated that with all learning. Um, yeah. And I, I as well didn't understand that, you know, I could learn these things that I have interest in. The first book that was handed to me, I was 19, um, was Who Moved My Cheese? Mm -hmm. And that was like this cur like this precursor into, wow, th there's this whole world that I can discover through books um, yeah. and learn from some of the masters who've already figured it out, right? And, and um, you know, part of what I do with this podcast is like, I'm, I'm the expert learner now, right? Like even in these conversations, <laughs> I'm here to learn, I'm here to yeah. continuously grow and, and books is just an extension of that. So, you know, I hear you talking about all these incredible books and these authors and, and all this stuff. And over the last 18 years, I don't even, I can't even imagine how many books you've read. Do you know the number? <laughs> I, I wish I did. You know, I, I only really started cataloging what I was reading when I started the podcast. I can look back over the eight, last eight years and tell you the 390 some books I've read. Wow. But the 10 years that preceded that, and it's, 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 it's a guess. <laughs> I'm not sure. No, for sure. I mean, obviously, yeah, I'm sure you're over, well over 600, 700 books at this point. Yeah, and and easily. that's that's pretty amazing. Now, what comes with that is an insane amount of knowledge, like a fire hose of knowledge and <laughs> things you can implement and things that like, and, and I'm sure you've read books that are contrasting of each other. One says this, the other says this. How do you pick and choose, number one, what are the things you're going to start to implement into your life or your business? And number two, uh, do you ever change your mind when you read the next book and you go, oh, wait, this is saying something different and this is more intriguing to me? Yeah, the picking and choosing part oftentimes just begins with what interests me. And I think that uh, should be the case for everybody. I think if you if you are always reading uh, about topics that interest you, um, that you're driven to learn more about, you'll never be bored. Uh, I hear a lot of people talk about, you know, like, they're bored with reading. It puts them to sleep. Well, you're not reading about exciting things. You need to find exciting things to read about. And for me, that's that's growing in my business. It's growing uh, personally and professionally. Um, it's learning new skills. All those things excite me. And so, um, and, and those can be very specific things. Like, for example, uh, public speaking is a topic I never get tired of reading about. Hmm. Um, it's something that I started reading about 18 years ago. 
and I've probably read 25 or 30 books, uh, all coming at different angles on that topic. And, and to your point, you know, I've read some public speaking books that go into details about like, you know, how to, how to pace or not pace and where to stand and what to do with your hands and all this kind of stuff. And projecting and then other books that just poo poo that and go, don't worry about that crap. Don't worry about yeah. that stuff. <laughs> you, know, you know, just, just worry about, uh, you know, uh, your message and crafting your message and delivering your message in a compelling way. So, so there's certainly been some disagreement along the way, but, uh, but I, I, one of the, one of the things I want to kind of get across here is, you know, sometimes we're going to read nonfiction in particular, uh, read with the, uh, the notion that when we get done reading, there's going to be six things we're now going to do or whatever, right? There's, there's, there's these to do uh, to do's that have been added to our to our list, but sometimes it's okay to read nonfiction just for how it impacts your thinking, right? Mm. Um, there doesn't necessarily have to be a to do list uh, after you're after you're done, and sometimes that can depend on the type of book that you're reading as well as to which one that is. Um, but yeah, I, I, for me, when it comes to, to picking and choosing, it's often, where do my interests lie? What do I want to know more about early on? That was mindset and books that were critical to me with regard to mindset helped impact how I looked at myself and what I considered myself to be capable of. And books that I read got me out of limiting beliefs and thinking that I was always going to be working for someone else. Mm. Uh, you know, 10 years ago, or even, uh, yeah, 10, 12 years ago, if you'd asked me, Jeff, or you ever see yourself, you know, being your, your own boss, I would have probably said, no. Um, the reason I'm able to do that today is in large part because I read books that got me outside my comfort zone that pushed me to go further than I thought I was capable and to, to broaden my mindset about what was, what was possible. So if not for the books I read, I certainly wouldn't be, wouldn't be here. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned um, how you don't have to have a step-by-step -step process after every book. You don't have to implement everything. And I think that's huge. And it's important for people to hear um, because I talk often about information paralysis when I'm coaching people at our retreats and stuff like that. It's like, mm -hmm. look, you're going to get inundated with things, right? Like information and things you can do yeah. and things you can start to implement. The issue is if you look at the whole broad scope of things that you should do, you're not going to do any of it. Right. And it's yeah. about picking and choosing. Now there's things that you should put on the back burner and maybe it's something you should implement five, six, seven months down the road or even longer. Um, but again, you're constantly, Jeff, you're constantly absorbing information. What are some things that you do? Um, so you don't forget uh, the things that you're you're learning because I think sometimes when there's so much, at least for me and my ADD self, it's in one year and out the other. So how yeah. do you, you know, obviously retain this information that you're reading about? Yeah, it starts with how how you're going to capture some of this information. Uh, you know, David Allen talks about this and getting things done about having a having a way, a simple way to capture the things coming at you so that you remember the things you want to remember, do the things you want to do. And for years, it's changed recently, but for years, uh, that for me was, and is for most people, um, a notebook and a pen, but a, a notebook that has one purpose. So I've got a stack of notebooks over the years, um, each one for the purpose of taking notes from the books I'm reading, and that's all I use it for. I don't. That's not a multi-purpose notebook. It's just for notes from books. And anytime you're reading a book, I think it's important that if you want to get anything out of it, if you want to increase the likelihood you're going to retain and comprehend what you're reading and actually do something with the information, then synthesizing that for yourself is, is key. But here's one very important thing to remember. When you're doing that, write as if you're writing for someone else, as if someone else's eyes is going to see this one day and have to be able to, out of context, understand what it means. Ooh, I like that. And I say that because... The future you that's going to come back to this is someone else, right? And so you, you, when you think in that way, you're going to be much more likely when you come back to this information to be able to do something with it. Um, something I've changed recently in, in how I take notes is I don't take notes as I read any longer. So I use the Pomodoro technique. And so I'll set a timer for 25 or 50 minutes, depending on how much I want to reading I want to do. And then I'll read for that set of time and I'll only allow myself to make markings within the book and continue on and markings like an asterisk for something I think is important. I want to come back to and dig into more deeply, a question mark for uh, something I don't understand, or maybe I'm not sure I agree with. 
or maybe a cue for a quote that, or something the author said that I thought was, was relatively pithy. Um, and so the timer goes off. I take a break. I come, and assuming I've finished that chapter, I come back in the next Pomodoro session, 25, 50 minutes, whatever it is, I'm just taking notes. So I go back to those markings that I made. And that's when I dig in more deeply. And I don't just take what the, the author has said and just write it verbatim in a notebook. I look at what's said and I think about, well, how, how, do, how, do I, how does that impact me? How would, how would I act upon that? What do I need to do with that information? What does it mean to me? And I write it in my own words as best I can. Mm. Uh, and so separating those two out has been huge for me. As far as uh, you know, more options for retention and uh, comprehension, again, retention is, am I going to remember it? Comprehension is, do I understand it, right? Um, another thing I like to do is uh, teach the material. Uh, this was the case for me earlier in, the, in my career when I was experimenting with things I was reading um, and trying things. And I started to have some things actually work that I was trying. There were some things that didn't work, but those things were quickly forgotten. But the things I was trying from my reading that worked got me noticed. As I got noticed, I was then being asked to, okay, Jeff, I, we want you to present to this faction of the organization about what you've learned. Or then later, we want you to present now to this faction of the organization. That teaching uh, that I was asked to do uh, really helps you. It prompted me to uh, synthesize the information in such a way that, boy, I'm, I'm never going to forget this. I'm never going to uh, uh, forget what this experience was like because it forced me to sort of bring it down to its, its most easy to understand level because I was going to have to explain it to other people. So whether you're teaching in that environment or maybe it's one-on-one -on -one, uh, or maybe it's uh, in a book club or maybe it's you know your local chamber of commerce you're presenting to, whatever it might be, it can just be you and one other person. When you're teaching what you've learned, it really uh, increases exponentially the, the uh, likelihood of retention as well as comprehension. So, so that's, that's my best advice when you want to increase both of those. No, I love that. And I love the little notations that you make in the book that you can go back and, and read over. I think that's genius. And that, and actually that's going to be something I implement starting immediately because <laughs> there are moments where I'm like, I've lost, I've lost that. Like, because I don't mm -hmm. take notes while I read and I would rather take them post. Um, I like those notations. I think that that's, that's super key. Now I'm somebody who, when I read a book, or choose a book. Sometimes it's just the cover or the topic or whatever. I'm like, oh, I'm interested in this. Mm. I can get into it and get real bored real quick. I'm not a systematic mm. book reader, right? I'm very much a storytelling book reader. Like, uh, really, really enjoyed Jim Quick's book, Limitless, because he ties in a lot of personal stories. Although there was a lot of anecdotal things, I liked the personal stories. I really loved Mike Kim's book, which is the last book I just read. He brought mm. in a lot of personal stories and tied it into himself. When it's very much step by step, I get bored. Do you ever give up on a book or are you somebody who, when you start, you're like, I got to finish this, even if I'm despising the whole entire experience? Yeah, I used to feel that way, like I had to finish it once I started. Here's what I tell people today with regard to what you're asking. Before you dive into a book, answer this question. It's sort of the begin with the end in mind type question. What's the goal? What do I want to get out of this book ultimately? Why am I reading it in the first place? actually write the answer to that question or questions down. They're all a different way to ask the same question, but write the answer to that question down. Identify it. And what that means with, with regard to nonfiction, as you look at that thing you want to get out of the book, go to the table of contents and now gravitate to the chapters that lend themselves, chapter titles that lend themselves to getting you to that place and start there. In nonfiction, we don't often have to start with chapter one, right? We don't have to read it from beginning to end. Let's start with the chapters that help get at the thing I want to accomplish by reading this book in the first place. And you may get that from two or three chapters and get everything you need from that book. Set that book down and you can call that book, in, in, in my book, you can call that book a red book. You can go to your good reader account and, uh, and mark it as, as red, right? <laughs> or good reads, Love I guess it, it is. Um, but yes, to, to your point, if you launch into a book and you get partway in and you just realize it's not doing it for you, don't do yourself the disservice of continuing to read. And this is why I always encourage people, when you start a book, 
always know, always have in the queue what your next book is going to be. So that if something like that happens, either two of the scenarios we just talked about, whether it's you realize you only need to read two or three chapters to get what you want from that book, or you read a couple of chapters and realize it's not for you, you've already got your next book in the queue, ready to go, and you're less likely to have that downtime where you get away from reading and you get out of the habit. So have yeah. that next book in the queue. So if one of those two things happens, you can move right to that book and start the process again. So what are you reading now and what's next in the queue? Oh, let's see. Um, I am just starting a book. Um, oh, what is the title of it? Um, by Dr. Dr. Sabrina Starling. I'll have to look it up because I can't uh, remember the, the title of it right now. Um, a book I just finished was called um, Evil Robots, Killer Computers, and Other Myths. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the Truth About AI and the Future of humanity. Now I can remember that long title, but I can't remember the short title from Dr. Starling's book for some reason. But anyway, uh, that was a was a very eye opening book. Uh, obviously about AI, but you know Hollywood and 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 popular culture tries to paint this picture that you know AI is going to kill us and take over the world and is is so powerful. And this book really kind of uh, poo poos that notion. I, I like to use that, that that phrase. Apparently, I've used it twice now. <laughs> Uh, that notion that you know AI is not nearly as smart as we as we think it is, and uh, in the case of most AI, uh, it, it just does one thing really really well, and then AI yeah. is going to be you know uh, help us make wonderful strides as human beings, but but robots aren't going to take over the world uh, anytime soon. So that's a book I just finished, um, and then Doctor Starling's book is a book I'm I'm just about ready to jump into. In fact, later today. Awesome. No, no, I love that. And- so I'm curious because this is a question I get a lot just because of the 400 plus interviews I've done for my podcast, mm. you know, from all the people that you've read, is there a common theme with these leaders who have really become thought leaders in whatever they've written their book about? Is there something similar to each one of them to be able to be the person at the forefront of that message? Yeah. Uh, as I've looked at, I've interviewed about Oh, knocking on the door of 400, not quite as many as you, but um, uh, about 400 authors. And I have found that there are essentially five things. This isn't exactly the question you asked, but I think it gets at, at the question, uh, maybe in a roundabout way. But I have found that there are five things, besides being authors, that all of them seem to prescribe to or when, with regard to their personal habits. Like These are successful people. They're They've accomplished great things, and that's why they're writing about them a lot of times, right? With few exceptions. Most of them practice five personal habits and or write about these habits in their books to some degree or, or another. Maybe their book isn't all about that, but it, it, it comes through in their writing. Uh, so if you'll permit me, uh, quickly, uh, the five things are these. Um, they understand the value of getting outside your, com- uh, your comfort zone. They do what I call dance with discomfort. They lean into it. They leverage it. Uh, they do something every day that scares them. Uh, and I think to have a life worth living, that's something that we all need uh, to practice. Yeah. Uh, you can be comfortable all you want to be, but your life's not going to be very exciting if that's your goal. The second thing, not surprisingly, is they ritualize reading. We've, we've talked <laughs> at great length about that. So no more explanation needed there. Um, you want to understand how to examine your energy, do an energy audit every so often. And by this, I mean looking at your schedule from a sort of a 30,000 foot view standpoint, such that everything on your schedule and everything on your to-do list that gives you energy, color that green temporarily. And everything that you have to do that zaps your energy, color it red. And then if it neither gives nor zaps, color it orange and then step back and look at it. Do you see a lot of red? If you do, that's a problem. Yeah. Um, is there a way to eliminate things, delegate things? Could you bring some green to some of those things? Uh, are there a lot of red back to back that you could insert some green in between that sort of thing? I love that practice. Uh, the, the next thing is uh, they assemble their advisors. Uh, many of us today, people like you and me, entrepreneurs, uh, exemplify this through uh, attending mastermind groups, having a group of people, a personal board of advisors that we meet with on a regular basis to help encourage us, to challenge us, to hold our feet to the fire, to do the things that we say we're going to do. And then the last thing that most of these folks I've talked to practice is, is a morning routine of some kind. They understand the value of filling their own tank 
as the day begins before they try to go out and impact the world. So they master their mornings. Um, so uh, discomfort, dance with discomfort. Uh, that's the D. Uh, I, I didn't tell you there was an acronym coming, but here it is. Uh, <laughs> reading, that's the R. Energy, that's the E. Advisors, assembly advisors, that's the A. Master your mornings, that's the M. Acronym is DREAM. So if you want to uh, uh, realize your biggest dreams and your highest priorities, do those five things. What would you say is like the one thing that's massively shifted in your life because you've adopted reading to be so important? Uh, I think for me, and I, I hinted at this earlier, but for me, uh, probably the biggest shift is in working for myself. I spent 26 years working for somebody else, and there's nothing wrong with that. But there was always a part of me that wanted to do my own thing and be my own boss. But for two and a half decades, I didn't see that as an option. Mm. Uh, and, and it helped, frankly, if I'm being honest, that I got let go from my last radio job because that was a shove I needed. That was, quote unquote, permission that I needed to give this thing a try. Had it not been for that, I might still be working <laughs> a regular job. Uh, but that push combined with the confidence I had gained through the reading that I had done. And by confidence, I, I mean, like understanding what it means to run a business. I'd actually started a side hustle while still working a full-time job based on the reading that I was doing, suggesting that, hey, if you're going to work for yourself, you probably want to build a bridge, yeah, right? And so my side hustle was the bridge to that thing. And I learned about how to do that in the books I read and why that's important, such that when I lost my job, I jumped headfirst into my side hustle and in 30 days was invoicing twice as much in 30 days as I made in 30 days at the radio station. And that radio station job I left was the highest paying radio station job I'd ever had in my entire career. Wow. So when I saw it now, I, I realized it's one thing to invoice and another thing to have it in your hands. I didn't have it in my hands just yet. But when I saw that I could, I could invoice that amount of money in, in that span of time compared and compared it to what I had been making, I knew I was going to be okay. But if not for the books that I had read, none of those things would have ever been possible in, in the first place because I, I wouldn't have believed they could, they could happen. And they, they, those books helped me to, to come to that understanding. Dude, I, lo I love that. And, and again, so many parallels. I, I built a side hustle, got shoved out of my last job. <laughs> um, and then within 30 days, because I, I got uncomfortable and, and went head first, I was able to build more uh, than I had ever seen, you know, it was actually wow. a three week span. And I, and I credit a lot of that. I know a mutual friend, Mike Kim, I credit a lot of that too. In that time frame. I went and spoke at an event and had one on one time, first time I ever met Mike. And he said some things that really shifted some of my perspective on business. And, and, um, mm. but, but I love hearing that because, um, you know, books, it's really a built-in mentor, right? Like, you have the ability to learn from some of the greatest minds. Like you had mentioned Seth Godin, which he's, he's been on your show, right? Yeah. Twice actually. Yeah. Yeah. So how cool, let, let's talk about that really quickly as, as a fun <laughs> aside. How cool was that? Like the first book that really started this path for you. And then you're able to sit down and, and have two conversations with him. How, how crazy was uh, that? Yeah. You talk about full circle type moments. Um, and if I were going to, meet with Seth face to face or John Maxwell or, you know, name a name, uh, somebody who's been on the show, how much would it cost me? It probably cost a few thousand dollars and rightfully so, but you do a yeah. podcast and boom, you're, you're sitting down with somebody for 30 or, or 45 uh, minutes. Uh, what a lot of folks don't know, uh, I sh shared this with somebody yesterday. I've asked Seth to be on my show five times. I've gotten two yeses. Uh, and, and a lot of folks go, oh, really? Well, I just assume every time you ask somebody to be on the show, they say yes. No, that's not necessarily the yeah. case, as I'm sure you know. Uh, well, maybe everybody says yes to you. I don't know. But anyway. Oh, no, no, no. I wish they did. I wish they'd. I've been chasing people for years. Come on. <laughs> but yeah, that, that first time especially was a full circle moment. And I was nervous. Um, you know, I've been interviewing people at that time. It had been, I don't know, 28, 29 years, um, but was nervous to be interviewing him. And, and one of the things I wanted to get across was that impact. And I was able to share that story at the, at the start of the interview that I shared with you earlier about reigniting my love for reading. And I could tell there was a genuine uh, response from him that that really you know, meant a lot. Um, and then another full circle moment, um, similar to that one yesterday, um, the very first person I ever interviewed on my podcast uh, was Dan Miller, uh, who's a New York Times bestselling author, wrote 48 Days to the Life or Work and Life You Love. 
And his books was one of those books that I read that kind of helped build that confidence in me that maybe I could do this, this, you know, be my own boss type thing. And then yesterday he's interviewing me in front of his audience. That's awesome. And it didn't, it didn't even hit me until after the interview was over. I posted about this on social media uh, today because I wasn't even thinking about it while I'm doing it. I'm like, oh, wait a second. This is the first guy I interviewed about his first book. And he's now interviewing me about my first book. How cool <laughs> is that? So yeah, these, these, these uh, sort of full circle moments uh, are just pretty, pretty incredible when they happen. No, I, I love that, man. And, and podcasting it has been the greatest tool to have very, very similar stories for myself as well. Um, mm. Obviously, I haven't written my book yet. I'm in the process right now. So just so you know, I might be awesome. tapping on your door in, for 2022. <laughs> awesome. um, but, but you know, and, and super excited about it. It's, it's probably the hardest thing I've ever done. Now, obviously, being a, a lifelong reader, like, you know, uh, what not a lifelong reader, but a, a reader for the last however many years in your life. Yeah. What was your biggest challenge writing your book? Mm, yeah, good question. Um, probably the, the biggest challenge uh, when I started was the blank page, uh, as you hear a lot of writers talk about. But then it occurred to me one day, no, wait a second, there, there's nothing new un, under the sun. Everything I've learned, I've learned from somebody else. And a lot of it the last eight years. Guess what, Jeff? You have notes on that stuff. <laughs> well, let's, let's take out those notes and let's synthesize what we've learned from the notes you already have. So when I understood that, suddenly I went from blank page to, oh, how do I whittle this down to a 50,000 word book? You know, But it started out very, very overwhelming of, oh my gosh, I've got to write 50, 55,000 words. Where do I begin? Uh, but after a couple of months, it sort of, it sort of came to me, as silly as that sounds, it just came to me, I was like, wait a second, you don't have to start from square one. You've already been you've been writing for years. You just you just need to go pull that stuff out and and dig into it. No, I love it. And and a question that I ask every single person that I have on the podcast, and it's one of my favorite questions that I get to ask um, because I have the opportunity to interview some of the world's most successful people. However, you define success. Mm -hmm. My question for you is: What is your definition of success? And what are three things you do every single day to ensure that success for yourself? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and. and and I th it's a loose definition, uh, and I even mentioned it earlier, uh, but, not, but in a different context. But to me, success is being able to realize your biggest dreams and your highest priorities, whatever those happen to be for you. Uh, I'm a fan of Ronnie Ware and her book, the, uh, the Five Regrets of the Dying. It's a memoir. And mm. regret number one, if you're familiar with this, is, gosh, I, I, I lived a life that everybody else wanted me to live instead of a life true to myself. And so to me, success is living a life true to who you are and who you want to be and how you want to be remembered. And if you're not doing that, change that right now. And for me, that meant doing my own thing. That may mean something else for you, but that, that's, that's how I defined that. Uh, three things that I do every day. Was that the other part of the question? Yep. Um, well, in the mornings, I've got a, 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 I used to have these like 12 or 13 things and do my morning ritual that I alluded to earlier, mastering my mornings, as I like to say. And I used to think that I had to do all 13 of these things. I even had them regimented such that this thing was two minutes, this thing was 10, this thing was whatever Jeez. the length was. They were all stacked up three and a half hours worth of things. And the reality was, is I never, ever got to all of those. And one day I gave myself permission. This is a list from which we will choose a half a dozen or so things to do every day. And so I look at my day, my schedule, and I look at that list of 12 or 13 things. Okay, what do I need today to make today the best day? So I'll give you three things from that list that happen virtually every day. Number one, not surprisingly, is read. Uh, I'm always reading not only a book for the podcast, but I'm reading for my personal growth and fulfillment and pleasure. I'm reading a book right now called Do You Talk Funny? It's not anybody I'm interviewing on the show, but it's a book about uh, injecting humor into your public speaking opportunities, something I Love want it. to get better at. Reading a book called How to Take Smart Notes. As a guy who takes a lot of notes, I want to read from someone and what they have to say about how to do it even better than I currently uh, do. So I always set aside time to read. I think um, I don't, I wish I could say I do this every day. I probably do it about 80% of the time. So so I think that maybe, maybe that qualifies as every day, <laughs> every weekday, let's put it that way. And that's write down what I'm grateful for, who I'm grateful for, you know, what happened yesterday that was pretty cool. You know, today I was writing, I got interviewed by Dan Miller. 
you know, that, that was like something I don't ever want to forget how cool I thought that was. Yeah. So writing down and recording and being able to look back later on the things that you're grateful for, to be able to journal those and catalog those in and look back on them later. And the third thing um, I do is I write. Um, in addition to journaling, I just try to look at what's ahead, what, uh, what's down the road for me, and um, write uh, toward those things. By that, I mean write um, what I would like to ultimately see happen uh, with that. Mm. So uh, read, uh, journal, and then write toward uh, the future. So journaling for me is a lot about what's happened. The writing part is a lot about what I what I see ahead and, and how I would like things to to come to pass. I love it. All the so, things I hated in school and school taught me not to like, I do it every morning now. <laughs> and you're like, this is this is now part of my everyday this is life. Crazy. No, but it, it it is crazy. But you know, those are the things that have changed your life, and and obviously, it all began with reading. And so, I wrap up every single interview with the same question. But before we get there, let's get to the important stuff, man. Where do people get this book? Give us a, a 30,000 screen, 30,000 foot screenshot of what is this book all about? What can people expect? What's the takeaways uh, and why should they get it today since it comes out a week from today? Yeah. And, and if you're listening to this uh, before it's come out, um, uh, go to readtoleadbook.com and know that you can get the book for 40% off and get like several hundred dollars. Like it's $500 in free stuff, like the audiobook for free, a uh, bonus chapter, uh, a mini course and, and several other things. Uh, so readlybook.com. Uh, if you're listening to this and it happens to be after the books come out, um, make sure you kick the tires. If you're not sure this is a book you're, you want to uh, want just yet, I think it will be, but if it's not, you can kick the tires, download the introduction to the first chapter for free. It's all again at readlybook.com. But to your question about, you know, what, what is this book about? Who's it for? If you already know that reading is critical for success, don't think that this, this is not a book for you, that you don't need it. It's going to help you get more out of the books you read, some of those things we talked about today. If you aren't a reader yet, then this book will help explain why you should be and also give you tips on how to jump into that seamlessly. So uh, readtoleadbook.com. Grab those uh, bonuses if it's still in that pre-order time period and get the book for uh, 40% off while you're at it. I love it. And where else can people find you online? Where's your podcast? What's all the good stuff? Yeah. So readtoleadbook.com is the book website. And not surprisingly, the podcast website is readtoleadpodcast.com. <laughs> <laughs> easy enough. It's easy to remember, which I love, man. And like I said, Jeff, uh, I wrap up every single interview with the same question. And that question is, in your life, what has been your biggest moment of growth? Biggest moment of growth? Um, I would say these last couple of years, um, some people uh, look in the mirror and they see somebody who's, um, uh, it's too late to do what they wanted to do. You know, it would be easy for me to look in the mirror and go, Jeff, it's too late to become an author. I'm in my mid 50s, right? So I'm writing a book at 55, right? And some would say that's too late. I, I like the hashtag never too old. Mm, I love it. <laughs> uh, these last two years have been uh, a huge um, time of growth for me. I was writing the book uh, through uh, COVID. Uh, and I was not able to do many of those things that we talked about in the beginning of this conversation that I love to do. And that's speak in person and workshops and those sorts of things. And so uh, that was tough. Uh, but I, I tried to find the silver lining in that and, and leverage that time to, to write this book and make the most of that time. But it was, if I'm being honest, it was still very, very hard. You spend a lot of time when you write a book, as you know, alone. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's not something I like to do for very long periods of time. But as we all were experiencing, that's something a lot of us had to do last year. And it just really uh, pushed me to make the most of every day more so than I've ever felt pushed to do that before. Uh, and know that uh, regardless of what you want to do in life, um, it's not too late. But at the same time, don't think it's got to be perfect before you put it out there. I arguably, if I'm being honest, could have written a book a few years ago. You know, I've been doing a podcast for eight years. I've built a pretty significant platform. And there's some regrets for not doing that, Justin, in the sense that my dad passed away in the last few years. So my dad is not here to see the fruits of my labor. And, and that 
uh, I regret that. I, I, there's a part of me that regrets not doing this sooner. So if you're listening to this and there's something that you really, really want to do, but you're afraid to do it, let that be motivation to you. In other words, and I don't mean to sound morbid, but understand that if, if you wait too long, you might eventually get to do that thing like I have, but who might no longer be here to enjoy the fruits of your labor? Let that be a motivation to you to get off your rear end, quit making excuses and just, by golly, just do it. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I hear that for sure. Jeff, I'm excited to dive into your book and um, you know, obviously you're somebody I've been connected to for years and I've seen your work and, and to see it written down on a page, I feel like changes the game, man. And I, I can't wait mm. to dive in and read it and make sure everybody else, uh, obviously go get the book, go get it, read the <laughs> just go get it. But Jeff, honestly, thank you so much for coming on and, and sharing your wisdom with my audience. I look forward to having you on again in the future, because I'm sure we'll do that at some point, but this has been phenomenal. Thank you. Well, thank you. And I look forward to uh, reading your book when it comes out. And yes, you have an invitation to uh, come on the Read to Lead podcast when you're ready. I love it. Let's fingers crossed it comes out in 2022. We'll we'll see how that all plays out. It's yeah, man. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you guys so much for being a part of the Growth Now movement. This is how you can really help me out. If you guys enjoyed this episode, please share it out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all that fun stuff. And let's grow this movement to epic heights. And it's all going to be because of you guys. Thank you so much. And we'll see you next week.